I was in Yokohama, Japan for a week, in uh, Manila for a week, two weeks in Singapore, and just last week in New York. So what you're getting is the last vestiges of my vocal cords. But it's good for you because this next service gets the, the final points of it. <laughs> At the risk of uh, sounding like a mutual admiration club, I do want to honor Pastor Russ and Debbie. They are good friends. And uh, as he's pointed out, we've known each other from a distance, but we've traveled a lot. We've been to Turkey together. Uh, I remember one of the f brave Americans who would come to Turkey uh, and uh, do mission work there. Uh, we've been together in Japan, uh, London, and various parts of the world, and have really, in many ways, covenanted, I would use the word not loosely, because 20, 25 years is a long time. You don't just do that, which is not so often you find among the body of Christ. Uh, with Steve Merle, I've walked with a man for over 33 years. And that's just how I believe life ought to be, relationships. Uh, more than anything, in fact, this message is along those lines. A quick introduction about myself. This is my family. Sorry, this is not my family. That's my family. <laughs> I've got three sons, uh, all married. Uh, my oldest son, Joseph, uh, this is him and his wife and son, who has a trademark habit of carrying his wife over his shoulders and his son, and pretty much does it on top of mountains everywhere he goes when he travels. <laughs> and just last month, he had his, uh, finally had his second child, so I guess the, the, this trademark is over. I don't think he can manage another child on top of the other child. My second son, David, is uh, married to a, uh, a, a British lady. We've got one grandson over there. His name's Elijah. And then my third son has two children. In total, we now have five grandchildren, which is really a great blessing from God. I mean, there's nothing greater than having grandchildren and the joy of that. Uh, I, I, my son over here once told me, uh, carrying his youngest his, his son and saying to me, uh, Tata, would you change my diapers? And he said, do you love me, but you change my diapers? I said, I, I, I think your father loves you more than I do. Let him do that for you. <laughs> this is a picture of me when I was 21 years old, and this message, this message is entitled, What Would You Tell Yourself, Your 21-Year-Old Self? And this has been a growing message to me now that I've turned 62 this year. And I've often wondered, if I had an opportunity to redo things, what would I tell myself if I was 21 years old? And I would say, keep your faith simple. If you can keep it as simple as possible, the faith that God's given us actually works. Keeping it simple simply means, simple means clear values. And I find many times, at least in my own life, a lot of my issues were because my values were not very clear. Fortunately, as the Bible would have it, the words of Jesus came alive to me in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, where it says, Do not lay for yourselves treasures on earth, where rust and moth destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. That word treasures there is the word values. In fact, not just values, the highest of values. And when the Bible repeats itself three times in succession, the same word, it's trying to signal you about something extremely important. And this is one of those places where you find the word treasures repeated three times in succession. Now, it further says that do not lay up. In other words, what matters about values or treasures is not merely the treasure itself, but where you lay it up. And it says there is one that you lay up on earth, and then it goes on to say that there is one that you lay up in heaven. And there's a difference. One will last for all of eternity, the other one won't. And the clearer you can distill what those values are, the easier life becomes and the more, more profitable it actually becomes. Now, then he goes on to say, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when I hit this verse many, many years ago, this is probably about 14 years ago, something lit up that with values, life's automatic. I don't even have to think about it. My heart will basically make the decision for me. I don't even have to think about whether I'm gonna do it or not gonna do it. If I value it, at some level, I will behave the behavior, which makes the 
message even more important for me. And in that process, over that journey of time, I tried to ask myself, what is really valuable for me? Now, the interesting thing here is that where your treasure, uh, where you lay your treasure, there your heart will be also. And then it says about earth and heaven. Now, the scripture tells us in Genesis that as, 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 as the earth endures, sea time and harvest, day and night will never cease. In other words, the measure of what is valuable on earth is measured by time and space and time and seasons. In other words, what is, whatever we sow on earth is limited by time and season. And further, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, as, uh, uh, there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven, which means earth. Now, when you're dealing with matters of value on earth, you're dealing with matters that are tentative and temporary by time and measure. Now, notice the next verse, it says, it says, the eye is the lamp of the body. I like this. Pretty much in the world we live in, vision precedes values. In scripture, values precede vision. That word eyes, by the way, is the word of thalmos, which literally means vision, figuratively and literally. Because what the truth is, what you value, you see, and what you don't value, don't, you don't see. For instance, I, I learned this, uh, not for us, I learned this not from, a, from the Bible, I learned this from a dog, believe it or not. I never liked dogs. And my wife, uh, uh, the dog lover that she was, when we became empty nesters, I decided to buy her a dog, not realizing that I was the one who was gonna fall in love with the dog. But what was interesting was after I had the dog, the dog started to really grow in my heart. I started to value the dog, and all of a sudden, I started to see things I never saw before. For instance, I never saw pet toothpaste before, and now I began seeing shops. I began seeing pet stores and, and dog tags and, and dog collars because now my values have changed. When the thing in your heart changes, when you, when you don't have value excellence, you don't see it. I keep telling the church, when you don't value the lost, you don't see them. When your heart changes, the values changes, your vision changes. Now, notice where it says, but if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Then if the light is with you. Now, notice where Jesus goes and says, you can't serve God in money. That's clear. Now, that would be finances. Now, he's not saying that money's not valuable. What he's saying is one of these is more valuable than the other. When you deal with values, you're dealing with hierarchy. The whole essence of the existence of values is hierarchy. Now, next he says, you, isn't life more important than food? That word life there is the word suke, not the word bios, which is biological life, or not the word zoe, which is God's kind of life, but suke which means that which has breath, literally the person sitting beside you, your relationships. Notice where the Bible tells us that the two most important things in our lives are God and relationships. But very often we make money and food more important, which is trophy, which is what we consume, what fulfills us, what we enjoy, that would include your Netflix, amen? <laughs> and then it says, isn't your body more important than clothes, your health more important than clothes. Now notice here that there are a hierarchy of values. God, relationships, health are the most valuable, and obviously finance. And if you had those, really, these other two are really more temporary than you realize. Clothes, for instance, the fashion that we wear, the clothes we wear over time no longer is in fashion. Food, regardless of how nice it is, within six hours, all look the same, amen? And all end up in the same place. In other words, I realize that if I could just zone in on these four values, life works. That if I just focus on God, and by the way, Jesus never said that he didn't want you to have money, food, or clothes. He actually said, if you seek me first, I'll give you all of those things. The dilemma is the food and the clothes and the other things, it's actually not about just values, but the placement of these values that matters. That's the message. That's what I learned. It's like a cup that has three sides. You've got your relationships, you've got your health, you've got your finances, and you've got God. 
You've got a spiritual life, you've got a relational life, a physical life, and a financial life. It's it's almost like an abundant life that God wants you to have. Jesus did promise that I'm going to give you this abundant life. And what tends to happen is when you have these sides, you fill up the cup and you keep filling it up, not realizing that certain sides are stronger than others. And where we fail is when we realize that one side of it is not as strong as the other. And hence, the quality of life settles where one side of that thing is not as strong as the other. Because we hadn't put exact values on them and got distracted with all other values rather than the key values that are necessary in our lives. Now, what we do is we have God over there, and if we don't have him, the rest of that just flows out of our cup. Worse, we put ourselves on that cup And we stress ourselves out because now it's us trying to juggle these relationships, this health, these finances, and life becomes this turbulent affair of how do I make life balance and how do I make life work. Simple means clear values. And the clearer the value of God got to me, the clearer it became that life's about relations. Because my wife once argued with me, says, isn't it supposed to be health first before relationships? I said, your health is time-bound. You're not going to be healthy forever. The only things that you're going to see in heaven are God and your relationships. And when you understand that clearly, you begin to play life very differently. You kind of simplify. My wife keeps arguing with me about my clothes. In fact, she tries to dress me up all the time because I wear the same thing every day. And she said, why do you do that? Because I've just gone to the conclusion that clothes is number six. Amen? (laughs) She still doesn't agree with me, but it's actually simplified life for me. Values also overlap. You can't have one without the other. If you look at the top of this cup, you can't just have relationships. You've got to have your marriage working, your family working, your key relationships working. And that's hard and enough as it is, just with that section of your life. Then you start to try to make your health work, your nutrition, your, your rest, and your exercise, which is really some of the key things to make your, your health work. And then you look at your finances, your, your earnings, your savings, and your investment, and life becomes this challenging ordeal And many times we say that God's there, but pretty much it's us carrying that weight, carrying that pressure, trying to make that balancing act work, and it becomes hard. It really doesn't become simple. God, and here's what I've learned, what my practice has been, the simple practice is pray. I've learned how to pray every day. I've learned that the difference between Christian prayer and every other religious prayer is prayer is not really a thing that I do, but a heart that's directed towards God. I've learned that prayer, the absence of daily prayer in my life, is a daily declaration that I will attempt to make the day work without God. And that the presence of prayer is the daily declaration that without you, God, this day will not work. I found that many Christians have complicated their lives because of a lack of prayer. I found that prayer is like a tree that is seeking for the sun. If you put a tree inside a room or a plant, it will have its way looking for the window, trying to stretch itself out to reach the sun because it knows within its own biology that without the sun, he dies. Christians... I found, I've learned finally, after many, many years of thinking it was about having a daily devotional, that prayer is actually something I needed not just for devotion, but the whole day of my life. That when Jesus said, every time you pick up the bread and break the bread and pick up the cup, remember me was a reminder that I should not stop praying, but keep praying for everything, for any and every situation. It is fantastic because here's what happens. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, with prayer and petition, make your requests known to God. 
And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So now, I pray for everything. I pray for my marriage. I pray for my wife. I pray for my children. I pray for my grandchildren. I pray for my neighbors. I pray for my friends. I pray for my staff. I pray for my health. I pray for my nutrition. I pray for the exercises at 62. Some exercises don't work anymore, amen? <laughs> I pray for the supplements I should take. I pray for the earnings I have to make. I pray for my savings. I pray for the proper investments. I pray for the ones that lend well to my skill sets. I pray. Praise God. I've kept it simple. Wow. I've zeroed in on the values and, they br- and I bring them up to God. But I don't stop there. I don't just pray, I meditate on the word day and night. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's power in meditation. Amen. And not just meditating for anything, but meditating on the word of God. Because meditating on the word of God renews your mind that enables you and allows you to know God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Outside of that will, life's hard. Within the will of God, you enjoy freedom. A lot of people don't understand freedom. Freedom is about a relationship. The the word freedom actually comes from two words. The words pray, dumb. Privileged in the kingdom. That is literally the Gothic word, the root of it. The idea behind freedom was you enjoyed certain things for free because you were a child of the king in the kingdom. It's much like your son and daughter who enjoys free light, free water, free food, free bed, free electricity, not because that has no value, but because you love them enough to give them that value. That's the same freedom freedom that God says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So how do you seek that? His will, lordship. Not just playing religious games, not just praying, but knowing his word and meditating on it day and night so I might know his will and live according to that will and stay spot on in the middle of that kingdom where I enjoy all the freedoms of my God. But I don't just pray meditate, I proclaim the gospel. Don't you dare stop proclaiming the gospel. You need to proclaim the gospel every day, amen? When my wife and I moved to Singapore, we went from a five-bedroom house to a two-bedroom flat. We were back as lovebirds starting over. And one day, my keys for the apartment were lost. And my wife had said, you may have left it inside the washing machine or in your pocket, so it must be stuck somewhere in the washing machine. So one Monday morning, she wakes up and says, can you move the, because our dryer was on top of the the washing machine, can you move the dryer and move the washing machine out of the kitchen so I can open it up and find your keys? Now, two things you don't do on a Monday morning is talk to a pastor or just preach on a Sunday to carry a washing machine. (laughs) And worse, in in navigate it through a little kitchen. Worse, I'm thinking, How, what qualifies you to open this washing machine? And she said, well, I just watched a video on YouTube. (laughs) And so now I'm thinking, this is worse. I mean, not only, she might actually bust this thing and and, and, and services are expensive in Singapore. But you know how it is, I said, honey, let's not, and so a fight ensues and she says, that's the problem with you. You're so good at preaching, but you can't even do something I want to do on a Monday. I'm just being honest with you, okay? I mean, pastors have issues. (laughs) So now I'm standing out there and thinking, my goodness, I'm in trouble. It's 11 o'clock. I won't have lunch today. (laughs) So I go over the door and start knocking and said, sweetie, sweetie, uh, I'm going over to the grocery. I'm I'm going to buy some sushi. Do you want me to buy you any? I'm not eating today. So here I am, I'm in trouble, I'm walking down the street, and I'm, I'm condemned as condemned can be. What kind of a preacher are you? Your wife doesn't even like you. What, you, you say things, you're Mr. Relationship, and what, what? And then it dawns on me, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now no, and I started dancing to the grocery, Amen. 
don't let condemnation settle in you. You can't pray out condemnation. You can't. There's certain things that are not going to go away apart from what Jesus did for you. If there's any food supplement you need to drink, it's vitamin J every day. The reason why you don't share vitamin J very much is it's probably because you don't take it very often every day. The more you use it, the more you're going to end up talking about it. Proclaim the gospel. Finally, fellowship. Simple but not easy. And let me close with this one last thought. Simple means formed habits. And I, I learned this as a middle-aged man that I got habits. I've got issues. I found this verse in Hosea chapter 5, verse 4. Their deeds did not permit them to return to their God for the spirit of whoredom within them, and they know not the Lord. The word deeds there is the word ma'alal, which it can be translated as habits. It was that morning when I read that, I thought my habits are the very thing that's preventing me from coming to God because they were shaped by a spirit of whoredom. Let me just get something clear, okay? The number of demons on earth are the exact name number of demons the time of Adam and Eve. Is that, Pastor, is that all right? I mean, the, the demons don't multiply. Do you get that? Some of you are not sure. <laughs> so the per capita amount of demons per human beings at this point in history are a lot less. Are you getting this? Yes. So the way they do it is they shape habits in you. So the thing that you keep saying, the devil made you do it? No, your habit made you do it. They tempted you and deceived you and condemned you and accused you and formed that habit in you, and you're basically on autopilot and are actually helping them propagate their thing. Are you here? Now, formed habits. How are habits formed? Discovery. Where do we find that? Genesis chapter 3, verse 5. For God knows when you eat of it and your eyes will be opened. That's what discover is. Discover. Remove the cover from the eyes. The beginning point of all habits, whether good habit or bad habit, begins with a discovery. Football, soccer, basketball, swimming, chess, mathematics, good habits. Study hard. Pornography, alcoholism, cigarette smoking, whatever, drugs. You discover and you're on this habit. When I try to learn all the issues of my life, relationally, financially, physically, they were habits that I discovered, that eventually I desired. The Bible says that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, it was a delight of the eyes, and that it was a tree was to be desired, powerful stuff, you're on your way to a habit. Notice, it's not just a habit, it's a decision. Then she made a decision to eat the fruit. She took some of the fruit and ate, and she also gave her husband who was with her, notice, he was with her and ate. Just to be clear, some people think that it was all because of Eve that Adam and Eve sinned. I actually have a very different take on it. I actually think it was Adam who wanted to eat the fruit first, but was too wimpy to do it himself. (laughs) I know that being a pastor and having ministered to a lot of men. And I also know that from Scripture because it says he was standing right there with her. When they played back the video cam in the Garden of Eden, they saw Eve holding the fruit, about to partake of it, and when it panned out, he was holding the ladder. (laughs) Worse, they found out he had a a little stopwatch and trying to figure out how long before the poison killed her. And when it didn't, he started to eat it himself. (laughs) Some of you men are not laughing. (laughs) The point is habits. Decision becomes delight. There's a good book by Charles Duhigg on habit, which references a lot of the research on habit forming. They had this research on a mouse that was in a cage, and there was a trap door. When the trap door clicked, the mouse ran out and tried to discover the food, and they would find the food. They'd lock him back up, click, 
goes out, discovers the food again, lock him back up, click, and because of these, it put a ramp over the door, he would still try to go up the ramp because the desire was there. And then they increased the thing, and they said, let's put a little bit of uh, electricity on the ramp, and there, so he would get electrified and have his hair standing a bit, but he would still go for it because he had already made a decision. And when they increased the electricity, he still went for it because he was no longer just delighted, he was devoted. Wow. Addiction. In case you didn't know, that word devotion was first used in Scripture by the King James Version in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15, that they have addicted, which in today's English language is devoted. Because they're one and the same thing, aren't they? This is the process of habits. And unless you have a definitive strategy to change it, they're going to be there for life. So how do you change this? Discovery, desire, decision. It doesn't go into delight. You go in a dip when you discover God. I want to be healthy, but the old existing habits are stronger than the new ones. And so I'd go for the loop, the treadmill of the New Year's resolution. I feel like I'm moving, but I'm not really going anywhere. It's the same discovery, it's the same desire, it's the same devotion, same dip, until after five spins, you just drop out. Let me give you God's option. Discovery, desire, decision, die to yourself. Die to your passions. Your financial issues, die to the sale. Hello. Some of you are having a hard time now. Some of your marriage issues, my marriage issues, Die to your pride. Die to your selfishness. That's what it means to be a disciple. To all these disciples, if anyone should come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. That's when life got good for me. Clear values, God, relationships, health, and money. Pray, meditate, proclaim, and fellowship and keep dying to yourself. It's good practice because one day you will die. If you learn how to die to yourself every day today, you wouldn't have a problem dying when that day comes. Are you here? Come follow me, he said. And then what happens is your delights changes. Your delights become God's delights. Life becomes simple, clear, exuberant, joyful, fantastic actually, supernatural. Devotion becomes destiny. I tell my children and grandchildren now, don't attempt to make the natural supernatural. Jesus came to earth to make the natural, the supernatural very natural. You don't have to be weird to live for God. Amen? Do you stand on your feet as you close in a word of prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Just close your eyes. Just be still before the Lord for a minute. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this church. Thank you for Pastor Russ, Debbie, the staff, the team here. Thank you for South Point Church, God. Lord, the destiny of this church has yet to be seen, God, in years to come. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I decree, I declare, I call things that are not as though they were a beacon of light, supernatural power and grace. Lord, will not just revive, Lord, but cause an outbreak of evangelism, of strength, Lord, of, of generosity, Lord, of relationships will flow out of this church. Now, if you're here today and you're saying, God, I, my values are not clear. I believe that the grace is here for God to clarify those values. Would you just lift up both your hands towards Him? Just, be, just between you and Him. Don't look at anyone else. If you're saying, God, I, it's not my values, it's really, Lord, I haven't, 
got to the place, Lord, of just praying and meditating, of proclaiming and staying in fellowship with others. If that's you, just lift up your hands. Or if, not, if, if, you, if that's you, but you're saying, God, I want to take things to the next level. And for us that have issues and habits that we're believing God to die to, would you just lift up your hands and let me just pray. Father, you see our hands. Thank you for the grace to speak your word here this morning. We pray a breaking, Lord, of the patterns in our lives as we discover, as we desire, as we decide. Give us the ability to die to ourselves to delight in your ways, to be devoted to your ways, and to see our destiny shaped and fulfilled on this earth as you ordained. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. Amen.